I'm Sarah Lipton Lubet, Executive Director of Take Back the Court, where we are all court reform all the time because the Supreme Court is super messed up. Uh, and I am so glad uh, to be here with all of you today, uh, and most especially to be here with these amazing, amazing women who are some of the best advocates in the business. Uh, I will let them introduce themselves, and then we will get rolling. Latasha. Greetings. How are you all doing? How you doing that, Roots? I am Latasha Brown. I am co-founder of Black Voters Matter. We're a power building organization based in the South, and we do three things. One, we work to put money on the ground to grassroots groups. Secondly, we are working to mobilize and build a movement that is rooted in social justice and change. And third, we're shifting a message. We're creating a message that people, in fact, have power. Hi everyone, my name is Emma Hernandez. I am the communications manager at We Testify. We are an organization dedicated to the leadership and representation of people who have abortions. And so every day we are working to center and broaden the narrative um, that is told in the public sphere about uh, abortion havers, uh, their lives and how they come upon that decision, as well as the many barriers they have that traverse to access care. Thank you so much, thank you both. And I think no one is surprised here, right, uh, that the folks we have on this stage today when we're talking about the Supreme Court are experts in abortion access, in voting rights, right? These are all fundamental rights that this right-wing Supreme Court um, has taken on with a vengeance. Uh, and so for the next 30 minutes or so, we're gonna talk a little bit about that court what it is doing to destroy our democracy, and what all of us can do to take it back. Um, you know, in just the last year alone, the Supreme Court has ended abortion rights as we know them, has made it more difficult for our government to do anything to tackle the crisis of climate change, the court has opened the floodgates to increased gun violence. It's gutted our Miranda rights. It's eviscerated the separation of church and state, and it's just getting started. This is a court full of right-wing extremists who want to act as some sort of super legislature and impose their agenda on the rest of us against our will. And it's only going to get worse unless we do something to rein them in. You know, this, this is a court that ignores precedent, that cherry picks history, that straight up makes up facts in the cases before them to get the results that they want. Um, and all of this is really rooted in a more fundamental problem, in a deeper disconnect between the right-wing court and the will of the American people, the people that the court is supposed to be serving. Republicans have controlled the court for 50 years. I don't know that that's something that gets as much press and publicity as it should, for 50 years. And that's despite the fact that Democrats have won the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections. And unless we do something, unless we do something to create real, actual structural change, they're going to control the court for decades and decades to come. That's 100 years, backwards and forwards, of single party control of one of the most important institutions in our government. That's not how democracy is supposed to work. And yet, and yet, the way that we talk about the court, the way that it gets covered in the media, right, it's as if they're monarchs, they're deities, they exist, right, on this special plane that we mere mortals couldn't possibly understand. Uh, and it tries to give the notion that what the court does, I mean, it really, it really isn't our business, but it is absolutely our business because we're the ones who have to live with the decisions that they make. And Emma, I'm really interested to hear um, your experience and, and what you think about this. You know, you live in Texas. It's really ground zero uh, for the fight to protect abortion rights, voting rights, immigrants' rights, so many of the things that we care about. What, 
what has your experience been? What's happening on the ground? Um, what has happened since the Dobbs decision? Yeah, um, well, we're about two months out from the Dobbs decision, Roe being overturned, but um, we are also quickly approaching one year since SB 8 was enacted in Texas. And so um, while this is newly top of mind across the country, um, Texans have not been able to access abortion care for an entire year past the six week mark. And I speak on that as a you know, repro worker. I also speak on that as a person who in February of this year found themselves pregnant in a criminalized context um, and had to speak on the phone with a clinic that was two miles from my home, uh, be told that they could not offer me care and be referred to a New Mexico clinic 600 miles away. Um, and it's, ex it's devastating to understand that nothing had changed in the safety or efficacy of the abortion care that I was seeking. Um, the only thing that had changed uh, was that now these providers had their hands tied. Um, the court had made this, uh, you know, seen this happen, hadn't stepped in, um, and abandoned us in the state of Texas to navigate it on our own. Um, since then, it, very frankly, people have not been able to access their abortions. People have had to travel for care. Uh, people in this very big time of need have also found themselves unable to lean on support networks that should be able to uh, get them where they need to go, but for fear of criminalization, um, for fear of putting their family, friends, loved ones um, in legally precarious situations, should they be supporters? And on the other hand, uh, should you disclose to the wrong person finding yourself criminalized? Um, it, it's getting increasingly difficult. Um, and Texas has been and will continue to be the future of abortion in the United States. Um, we're, we're already living the impacts we already have abortion funds who've had to pause their services while we figure out how to navigate this. What does it mean to aid and abet? Um, what does it mean for me as a communications professional to be managing the social media <laughs> of an organization uh, who's sharing information as to self-managed abortion care? Um, is that directly assisting someone in making those choices, whether that message be sent in Texas or across the country? And so it's, it's very difficult, um, and we know that what happens in Texas doesn't stay in Texas. Uh, we're seeing copycat laws pop up. Um, we're seeing um, increasing criminalization um, for pregnancy outcomes, regardless if they include abortion within that spectrum. Um, and so it's, a, it's an incredibly difficult time, and to your point, and these decisions are made elsewhere, but they're impacting people like me, uh, black and brown community members, uh, who, you know, luckily I was a person who knew the options that I had, who knew how to get to where I needed to go to access care. As you can see, I'm not pregnant today. I'm happy not to be. Um, but what's, <laughs> yay! <laughs> um, but what happens to the person who doesn't know the options that are still available to them? And what happens when, you know, in one quick phone call that tells you, you're already past six weeks, there's nothing we can do for you here. Um, what happens to that individual and how can we step up and show up for them? You know, I, I had been thinking about, it's been not even two months, right, since the Dobbs decision overturning Roe and, and all of the devastating stories that we see like day after day, minute after minute, and all the ones that we don't see, that don't get reported. Um, and it's just so sobering to think about the fact that it's been a year since SB8, that folks in Texas have been living with this for a year, and just how absolutely lawless that was of the Supreme Court. While Roe was still in place, they did this, right? And it just gives you like an insight into how completely free they feel to do whatever they want, no matter the impacts on our lives. And, and that's only one piece of it, right? I mean, there have been decisions this year, um, you know, impacting gun violence, impacting climate, so many decisions on the shadow docket, um, undermining voting rights and the redistricting process in Alabama and Louisiana and Wisconsin. Um, and I'm, you know, curious, Latasha, to hear, to hear your thoughts on those. And also, I think we're all starting to get a pretty good sense of just how bad things are. 
but how should they be, right? If this court were working the way it should in a democracy, what would it look like? What's the vision? You know, thank you for asking me that question because I do want us to disabuse ourselves from this notion of we gotta take back the court. When was the court ours? Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm raising that because the, the Supreme Court, and I'm a person from the South, and there have been critical decisions that were made in the court that actually provided protection for my community, or at least extend, had an interpretation of extend rights. But I do want us, I'm, I'm, I'm raising this because I also want us to be mindful around that the Supreme Court it has this deity status because it has always been a tool to, to protect the interests of white supremacy in America, always. Um, and to the extent in which it has shifted, it is when the politics and the, and, and the politics and the people have demanded that it be shifted. Let's, let's recognize that slavery was legal. It was ordained by the court. The fact that African Americans were three-fifths of a human being, that is what the Supreme Court actually ordained. I'm raising that because I think what we have to really recognize is that as we are moving into, we have a court that does not even reflect the American people. We just got an African American woman on the court, right, for the first time. I'm raising that because I think there are three things as I think about, I want us to think about the court. The three things are, I want us, first and foremost, we have to resist. We cannot say that it is okay and act like the Supreme Court that they have power that supersedes our powers of people. And so that means means we have to literally be organizing and resist what is happening right now, whether that's filing lawsuits, whether that's continuing. I know people say, well, we're not going to file lawsuits because we might not win. I mean, that's like telling folks who were, were enslaved, it's like telling my ancestors, we're not going to try to be free because there's a, a, a slavery a law in place. The bottom line is you resist because that's the right thing to do, right? That is the thing that is going to push the boundaries. And the second thing we have to do, I call these the three R's, is we've got to organize. We've got to reorganize ourselves in such a way that people really understand that we have power to be able to shift the court, that that's not a novel idea. The court, Supreme Court has actually been either expanded or shrunk seven times. Most people don't know that, right? And so I'm raising that because we have to also educate and organize people to know that there can be a shift. There's no shrine of, of the, the Supreme Court that you can't make any changes. The third thing related to that is we have to reimagine. We have to radically reimagine because let's be honest, that when we're talking about, well, what did the founding fathers intended? Well, the founders, founding fathers didn't intend for me to be talking to y'all up here, right? Because at the end of the day, they couldn't even recognize my humanity, right? So I don't live with the founding fathers. I am a founding mother of a new America. That's who I am, right? And so, and we all have to shift this framework to start seeing ourselves as not just citizens of this nation, but we have to start seeing ourselves as founders of a new nation, a nation that what is in the Constitution, that we all have access to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that that is real. That's not just for a select few. And in order to do that, that is going to require us educating people and letting people know, have the opportunity to believe that we can actually create something that is more reflective. Eli Mistel, in his book, he talks about that if you actually expand the court, what it does is it actually prevents the opportunity for actual extremes. Mm -hmm. Because it is, when you have more people that any of you all been a part of a committee, it is much harder <laughs> to come up with an extreme position when you're in a committee than for two or three people to come up with themselves, right? And so there is a benefit for the American people for there to be expansion of the court. We have to shift it out of this frame that is about what party has power and control of the court. We have to shift it into the frame that people have control of the Supreme Court. I feel like I can't nod my head any harder. It's gonna fall off. Because it, I think it's just so, so incredibly critical, the, the point that you made, Latasha, that we have to peel back these fictions that we've had about the court. You know, this, pretend sense that it lives in this magical universe of perfect law and reason um, and has the power to rule over us when it has always, always been, save, I don't know, maybe seven to 10 years, an institution that has reinforced um, the powerful, that has taken power away 
from people that has reinforced conservative institutions. And right now, it's doing that on steroids. Um, and so that education work is, is so incredibly critical, that reimagining um, is so incredibly critical. Um, you know, I, I take back the court. Um, we have been laser focused um, since, since our inception several years ago on Supreme Court expansion, on adding seats to the Supreme Court, which as you said, has been done seven times before in That's history, right? right? That's, <coughs> it's something, not that we love them, but that the Founding Fathers did, right? right? Absolutely. So it is, it is in the toolbox, and we've been focused on that because that is the way to wrest control away from these justices who are dead set on undermining our democracy and to create a new institution that actually supports it. And also because it lets us be real about what the problem is um, and how bad the problem is and that we can't just like paper it over or, or prop it up, right? We have to actually take it head on. You, you, the only piece, the, the part that I also want to build off of what you're saying is we have to see this moment as an opportunity. Yes. Now, oftentimes we see what's happening was like, oh my goodness, like, we, we, why are they doing this as if they were okay before, right? We literally have to see this as an opportunity to organize our communities around how do we create a justice system that is really rooted in justice, not punitive measures where we have more people incarcerated than anywhere in the world, not when we know that corporations are protected more than people, not when we know that workers' rights are being struck down, not when we have a court that tells us what rights we don't have instead of protecting the rights that we should have as human rights. I'm saying that because I really want us to recognize in this moment, we can't get caught up in the partisan paradigm either. Mm -hmm. That we think this is just about a party having control over the court. That we have to really push this and recognize that we've got to restructure and have a court system that has some sense of accountability. Currently, our court system is the deity that has no accountability. You go there, you do what you want to do, you die there. Right, and so, and, and it's also been politicized in a way. So how do we, I think the only way that we can actually reverse that trend is we have to reimagine what the court system should look like that would actually be in service of, the, of people. And, and I think we're seeing right now a real, a real openness to that among people, right, in communities as we're feeling the, continuing to feel the devastating impacts of the decisions that keep coming down and it keeps becoming more and more real in people's lives. Emma, I'm curious, um, you know, how, how this work of court reform, how this work of um, re-envisioning um, what, what the court should be, what role it should play, plays into your organizing work. You know, your organization, we testify, it's amazing. If you don't know it, you should. Um, focuses on, on, you know, sharing folks' experiences of seeking abortion care. And you might not automatically think, oh, well, gee, you know, you'd be on a panel about court reform. <laughs> so how, when you're talking to communities, when you're talking to your storytellers, when you're doing that organizing, how, how does this fit in? Yeah, um, well, the great thing about We Testify is we are 100% staffed by people who have had abortions. Um, and what that means for us is our allegiance is primarily and first and foremost to folks who have had abortions, uh, who are in the process of seeking abortion care and who will have abortions in the future. We don't have an allegiance to a deity, a certain court, um, a president, um, we're here to enable folks into making the decisions that they need, accessing the care that they need. Um, and how that plays into our work is um, our decision to uh, join the Just Democracy Coalition uh, to make sure that uh, we're pushing out the message of all the different options that are on the table to expand abortion care. The same way that we uh, will share the message of all the different types of abortion care that are needed um, and all the, the breadth of abortion stories that need to be out there when we're advocating for medication abortion, in-clinic abortion, self-managed abortions, herbal abortions, if that's your choice as well. Uh, whether you're a person that has to travel 
who sought an abortion for a medical reason because your own health was in danger, or you simply didn't want to be pregnant. Um, that same way, we're looking at all the different options that are on the table to expand access to abortion care, whether that be expanding the court, whether that be ending the filibuster, whether that be DC statehood. All of those different options are on the table, and we're going to talk about it. Um, sometimes we are the ones sticking out our necks, and it's taken a little bit longer for you know national organizations to get out there with us. Uh, but because we have uh, abortion havers in mind from the jump, then that's who we are thinking about when we're th supporting certain policy, when we're, we're getting out there within our organizing work. Um, and it goes beyond the messaging that we're sharing online. Uh, we're also investing in the abortion storytellers themselves. And so when we are deciding that we're going to support court expansion, we're also having meetings with our storytellers to explain the issue to them. So that, that we're not just using their stories to you know, propel forward our mission or our goal so that they truly understand and can grow as thought leaders so that they can be on a stage such as this one to say, I have an opinion on this. I've also lived this experience. This is what it means to me. And this is you know, why you should support us. And that's a big message for us is to invest in abortion storytellers because we should be at every table. Um, we should be in every space where decisions are being made. Uh, if this is going to be the focus of so much you know, attention and work and restricting our access, um, then we need to have uh, the people that are actually impacted there. Amazing, um, and you know, to, to Latasha's point earlier, right? We are the people who should be shaping the law, who should be shaping these institutions. They're supposed to be accountable to us. They're supposed to serve us, um, and I, I think we're seeing a lot of a lot more recognition that there's something really, really wrong, right? The Supreme Court's approval rating right now is in free fall. It is plummeting. I mean, honestly, it's probably lower right now than it was when we started this panel. And that's because people don't want to be ruled by some justices trying to bring back some like 18th century way of being, repeal the whole 20th century, all the progress that we've made together, and tell us that we're not full humans with equal rights who can decide what we want to do about our own bodies, right? So like people don't want that in their lives. Um, Latasha, you mentioned this was a this is a moment, this is an opportunity. Are there things you think are are holding us back, or what do we need to break through in order to continue to build this movement and and do that really critical education that says the court is not some untouchable god, right? It's mm. a part of our government and it's responsible to us. This this may be hard, but we're going to have to lean in the discomfort of change. And, and the reason why I'm saying that is that we also have an affection and attachment to that which we know. Mm -hmm. And so part of, we, part of the reason why the Supreme Court continues, we continue to be in this volley between, well, do the Democrats have control of the court or whether the, Supreme, uh, the Republicans have control of the court, as if the court belongs a, is another you know, power tool for political parties, instead of literally being a, a, being a uh, part of the government that literally is in some space looking for the best interests of democracy and its citizens. And so because of that, part of the politicization of the court we are partly responsible. I know that's hard for us to accept, but it is because in many ways we've actually accepted that the model that we currently have, that that model is, we just gotta get more, we just gotta get more people on it. We just gotta take control over it. Yes, that may be a temporary solution, but in order for us to have justice in this country, let's, let, let's be honest, at the moment in which the Supreme Court was de um, in this democracy was envisioned, it was by white men of wealth that the majority of people in this country were not even a consideration. So why are we using them as the footnote of what did they think, right? They didn't even consider most of us, including white men that didn't have land, they didn't consider you either, right? And so I'm raising that because I think that it's really important for us to really see that part of, if we are to have the democracy that we desire and we deserve, it is going to require us going to have an evolution of thought. And it is going to require us to be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right, with change ourselves. And it's going to require us being experimental, right? We're going to have to be innovative and experimental on, on the local level, on really being able to start having these conversations with our, our networks, with our communities. Whether you do work in the space around Supreme Court or not, 
We all should be talking about it on some level and having discussions so that we are actually we're actually getting the base ready. It's almost like if you're a farmer, you got to till the soil. And so this is the moment that with the Supreme Court so out of place. Now, in the meantime, we got to win these elections in the midterms, right? Um, so that there are some checks and balances. But at the end of the day, we have a short term. Sometimes we're so focused on the short term victory. We've got to get this person, this party in that we're missing the opportunity of really how we're going to make long term structural change so that we don't have to continue to go in this endless this valley of who is in charge and who has power. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yes. Um, and I think, you know, do, doing those things at the same time, right, this, this short, short term urgency that we have um, as these decisions keep coming down, as the court keeps taking actions. Um, like it has in voting rights cases over the last couple of years, and there are more on the docket in the fall, right? This court is gonna to continue to take actions to like further insulate itself um, from the people, from democracy, from you know, the ability that we have to make change. So, so there is an urgency and also it's a long-term fight. It's a long, <laughs> it's a long-term fight that we all have to really like sign up for and dig in and be committed to. You know, we didn't get um, we didn't get the situation that we're faced with now overnight. That's right. Um, the right, the conservatives, they have focused on this for a very, very long time, um, and it is time. It is time for progressives to step, step into this fight, um, to step into this power, um, to, to take it seriously and to change this institution so that we actually can have some justice at some point. Absolutely. Um, you know, we have here today like all these amazing activists in this room, everybody watching at home, if there were well, I'm not gonna give you a number, one thing, two things, three things, any number of things. You wanna make sure um, that folks uh, come away from this conversation thinking about um, what are they? Emma, can I start with you? You know, first and foremost, as we say at We Testify, everyone loves someone who's had an abortion, um, and so keep that in mind in your work. Uh, Look into yourself, what abortion stigma are you still carrying? What makes you uncomfortable about this conversation? Because we are moving into new spaces where we're putting folks uh, to share their own stories. So um, how can you step up for us and um, let abortion storytellers take the lead? Uh, we can play the game while at the same time saying this shit is rigged. <laughs> we are, uh, we're out here, we're doing the work, but we can still criticize the establishment, the systems that are in place, uh, and acknowledge the fact that uh, it doesn't work for us, and we need to be making change. That's right. Thank you. Natasha? You know, I'm from Selma, Alabama, and so if there was something that I would leave to tell people to do, you know, it would be in the same wise words of those who were the 600 people who actually won the Edmund Pettus Bridge that didn't have politics on their side, they didn't have government, they didn't have money, but they were able to actually push democracy, this country closer to democracy than anybody else. And with that, well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. That's my words. So I will just say thank you. Thank you so much, Latasha. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, all of you here today. If this conversation has inspired you to, to get more uh, into the fight, uh, to reshape the, the Supreme Court, to take back our democracy, please reach out. Reach out to us at Take Back the Court. Black Voters Matter, we testify. We would love, love to work with you. Um, let's get this done. Thank you.